We're back to Neil Haley's show, and I'm first excited to welcome my co-host, Paul Hollis. He's also the author of the Hollow Man series, and he's got some big other things coming up soon. Paul, how are you? I know you're excited about our guest. I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I, I'm uh, always uh, looking for, for great authors, so we got exactly. one right here. Exactly, to learn from different authors and different things. So our guest today is Stona Fitch. And Stona is wrote in a new book called Death Watch. Stona, thanks for stopping by, man. How are you? You bet. Great to be here. Okay. We, we, we think about Death Watch, but before we get to this book, how long have you been writing for? You've, been, you've written seven books, right? So you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, this is my eighth. Um, I, I think my first came out in the early 90s, and I've written um, under my own name, of course, but then I, I wrote a crime series set in Boston under the pen name Rory Flynn. Uh, so yeah, I, I, you know, I write a book every two or three years, whether I want to or not. So you're really into crime and different things. What made you interested in that? Well, I was a crime reporter briefly in Miami um, uh, right after college, and I, I found it fascinating, but I also realized that I like to make things up, which uh, wasn't really uh, something you want to do as a reporter, ideally. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I like to tell a story. And uh, I had the privilege of studying fiction with Joyce Kerloats and Russell Banks in college. Russell was a mentor to me for years, the late, great Russell Banks. And, uh, you know, like me, uh, he focused on sort of dark topics, some of which abut into crime. And that's pretty much where I am. I would say it's uh, Death Watch is a dark satire. There is a crime in it, uh, but I, you know, I, I, um, I like to push the boundaries a bit. It definitely seems like you like to push the boundaries, and we'll get into Death Watch. So, so yeah, tell me specifically why you wrote the book Death Watch. Well, I wrote it. Um, I had an experience where I was working with a um, Italian watch company to help them relaunch their watch brand. Uh, part of what I do is my day job to support my fiction habit is I work with uh, mostly technology companies to, to tell their stories. And uh, this watch company was kind of defunct and needed to re-enthuse itself. And I got involved with a guy who was an, uh, kind of an entrepreneur, but kind of a shady entrepreneur. And uh, we had a bunch of meetings and talked about how to re-enthuse the um, brand and how to make these new watches beautiful and everything like that. And then it at some point, and I did a lot of research on watches, which I didn't know anything about. Uh, at some point, he just disappeared. He just went completely ghost on me. <laughs> so uh, I was left with uh, some bills and some free watches that I gave away, uh, but also left with a pretty deep understanding of how watches worked. And one of the things I like to do as a writer is to take something normal, uh, an experience or a thing, and push it to its sort of illogical uh, extreme, you know? Uh, so with regular watches, normal watches that people buy for fair amounts of money, they're, uh, they contain complications like the, the phase of the moon or they chime on the hour. And I, I decided that, well, what would be the ultimate complication for a watch? And that would be that at some point the watch might kill you. Oh my gosh. And that's, that reminds me, I don't know if you were a fan of uh, Heroes and Siler and how Siler used watches to get inside people because he was a watchmaker type thing. And then he got this ability and he cut everyone's head open and made it like, because he knew how to tinker things. And he would take everyone's abilities and put it in his brain. Oh, if only I could do that. Um, no, I, I have heard of that. And yeah, I, this... I kept it a little less gruesome, uh, and it's a little less clear whether this is actually a functional death-dealing watch or whether it may be a hoax. You know, that's part of the uh, journey for the reader is to judge for themselves whether it's real or not, and uh, and that becomes more clear as the book goes on. Uh, but yeah, it's it's um it the 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 bit that makes it a little less dark is that it's not clear. Like, you put the watch on, you can't take it off. But it's not clear that if sometime within a minute, a day, a year, or this is the, the part that differentiates it, or never, it may not go off. So basically, it's, the, it's like Russian roulette when there may not be any bullets, or uh, the sword of Damocles on your wrist versus hanging over your head. 
So Paul, author to author, what, what question do you have for Stana? Oh, that, that's fascinating. I, I always learn when I get inside the head of someone else, and uh, and I, I appreciate you being here with us uh, today. But um, I, I'm not really sure um, what question. The the book sounds fascinating, fascinating. I, I've got to get that uh, as soon as we hang up here. I'm I'm going to get it. So, uh, but it, it is. Uh, it sounds like a fascinating concept, and and uh, I know you've done a wonder with it because you're you're always a bestseller anyway. So, yeah. That that's that, that's it. I'm just fascinated. Well, thanks, thanks, Paul. I mean, I think that uh, you know, as a writer, it's uh, you know, your job to compel people to turn the page. And yeah, uh, my books tend to be fast paced and compressed. I I can't write a book that's more than two hundred some odd pages. I, I don't write lengthy books, but they have a lot in them and they move right along. And uh, you know, I think one of the important things about being a writer is to raise a bunch of questions, not just tell a story, but give some, uh, some elements to the story that stick with the reader long after they finished it. So it's, it, it's, it sort of has two, two components. One is this story about a potentially deadly watch and two, just a lot of sort of satire and or critique of you know, the world as it is uh, in Great. 2023. You know, and creating these characters, how did you create these characters? Were, do they, are they people you've met before or just, or, or a specific idea, what would you say? Good question. Um, it's funny because the, the more I've, I've written and the more books I've written, the less the characters sort of come from people I know or people in my family. My first novel was pretty much a dead lift from you know people in my near family. Uh, and I learned that they don't appreciate that. you know. <laughs> you know. Um, so, and you should always change the names a little bit more. So, uh, I, I've, I've gone further afield, but you know, I'm, um, I'm I work uh, in you know technology and advertising, so I do have insights into how an ad agency would try to sell something as hard as a potentially deadly watch, um, and so some of the material there is drawn from my own experience. The characters, though, it's funny. I, like right now, I'm working on a new book, and every morning I wake up and there's a character in my head jabbering away one of them and a lot of the you know once you sort of create the general outlines of a character then they sort of tell you uh you know who they are and what they've got to say you just have to be quiet and listen to them and and that's generally what i try to do is is the um is there only one watch like this or is it a whole brand of watches well, there is one to start with, a prototype that ah, my main okay. character pops on his wrist during a, a presentation, as it were. Uh, but no, it's a it's a mass produced. It's high. It's expensive. So there, okay. it's a boutique, you know, high end watch. Like when you open up a magazine and you see these slick advertisements for you know high end watches, it's one of those. But it has you know a difference. What feedback awesome. have people been that read the book so far have said? I'm sorry, I missed that one. The feedback you've been getting from people that read the book. Oh, uh, good question. They're, you know, they, they, and it's at this point, it's still for early days, but everybody who's read it, and I don't, this sounds whatever, but they just sped right through it. It's, it's a fast read. Um, but they also felt like it, it was, you know, raised, like I said, raised some questions. They all come to me with some questions. What do you mean by this? What is this? Is this what you really think? Uh, you know, and, but, it, but it's generally, uh, in the blog reviewers and the book reviewers and, uh, and radio shows and, and citizen readers, you know, they liked it a lot. And I, you know, it's, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, putting myself in the shoes of a reader and, you know, if it's not interesting to a reader, I cut it out. You know, I, I'm not doing a big chapter about the history of watches or something. I keep it really uh, everything's pretty tied to the plot and a lot of dialogue. It's, it's, even though it has a dark, uh, title and cover, um, it's funny too. It's, it's absurd. It's I, my, my favorite thing to do is to just, is to sort of dwell on the absurdity of a situation. Um, my novel senseless is about a businessman who's kidnapped and held hostage in Brussels, which sounds like, you know, an episode of black mirror. Um, but it's actually really the dialogue between the captor and the captive is sort of like, you know, it's, it's absurd, like a Beckett play. And, 
it's I just think that you have to be able to be both dark and light and readers who have read the book uh, enjoyed that balance. So tell me a tip for authors out there about marketing your book or at least putting your book out there once you have a book out. Because again, you wrote so many and you got published and then the challenge is now is to get people to buy it. So what do you think the best strategies from releasing this many books to get the best? You know, it's funny. It's funny because I've been published by major publishers and small publishers and and this is through a project called Aero Editions, which is part of Concord Free Press, a project that we've been doing for 15 years that inspires generosity among readers. So there's, I think it's a great time to be a writer. I think it's a very hard time uh, to get a mass audience for a book, uh, even if you're with a large publisher. There's just so much content out there and so much of it is you know, great television, great films. Books are always a separate channel and they're still very uh, you know, viable and they're often the root of a lot of other creative work. So definitely write the book. In terms of getting attention, you, know, you just gotta do whatever you can and everyone's got a different threshold for how much, um, how much they wanna do. Um, I think it's just, you know, it's really, every book is a little miracle, you know, and I think the reward for the writer has to be seeing it actually complete and in the hands of readers and anything that happens after that in terms of sales or film rights or adaptations of any variety, you know, that's extra, you know, it's just, I feel like it's lucky. I, I feel like it's, it's lucky to, to be a writer, much less uh, find quote unquote traditional success. Uh, because I've been writing since the early 90s and the industry has you know, continued to evolve and devolve. And I think anybody that writes now is not, we're not writing in the 1970s anymore where it was the way people, people bought books very differently. So you have to recognize where you are right now in terms of publishing and just find your own path. So you think it's more of a passion thing with books and you have to figure out somehow other way of monetizing it in a way. Well, that's one that's that's one way to do it. The other thing is just uh, there used to be a dirty secret that you had a job, you know, and <laughs> if you were a writer, like you actually had a day job that you did something else and you try to keep it secret. And if you had a job, it had to be like teaching fiction. And now I think everyone uh, that has, uh, you know, that, that doesn't want to live in a teepee in the woods, you know, uh, you've got to figure out a way to make um, no slight there. I'm part Native American. So it's, um, you know, it's your own challenge as a writer to figure out a way to support yourself. And ideally, don't try to rely on fiction to do that, because I always tell people if like I relied on, even though I've, I've you know, I've, I sell books and I then my books come out as films. And if I relied on the money I made as a writer, a fiction writer, to feed my family, we wouldn't just be having lentils every night. We would be having the lentil, like like one little tiny lentil that we had to cut like so why months. would you say fiction so non-fiction writers can make money is it more than fiction writers in your opinion i think fic non-fiction is is a much more definable thing and fiction is just so whimsical because it's such a broad category and then usually with non-fiction i may i may be totally wrong about this because i've not written any um i think you tend to be able to get an actual advance up front or and generally larger money for your work um but uh, yeah, I'm just saying as a fiction writer versus someone who does something else during the day. I mean, you know, I work on evenings, weekends and federal holidays uh, and any other time I can steal away from my day job. It's your passion. Uh, it's, yeah, you got to do it. It's like a hobby. It made, maybe my podcast and radio show, people were thinking I was crazy 14 years ago. Why you put so much time and effort into it and help me make make money? And it's, well, the world, and it's not from the podcast. It's not from the radio show. It's from figuring out other ways to use the influence. Like you as an author, you know, when you're retired, you should be going out and just doing talks for people and teaching well, people never, how to write books and all that stuff. I will not be retiring, Neil, but I'd be glad to do all of that stuff. It's, it's <laughs> you should do it. Okay. So what movie, what books have become movies before I let you go? Okay, um, I wrote a novel called Senseless that I mentioned that was uh, set in Belgium, very, uh, came out on 9-11, day of, and uh, day of 9-11, 2001. And uh, that was a very bad day uh, for many things, not mm -hmm. just for uh, your book to appear, but yeah. it, and it was a dark book about 
terrorists who will do anything. So it did well in France <laughs> and, uh, and it got adapted into a UK feature film um, by um, Shoreline and it's out, it's on Netflix now. It's, it made its commercial run. And uh, there are two films I should point out called Senseless. One is the dark film based on my dark novel. The other is a comedy by the Wayans brothers. And we're not going to the Wayans Brothers one, even though I've interviewed <laughs> one of the Wayans, so, uh, so, but I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm going to go for that. Okay, so my, my, so this is such an interesting thing, Stone, and that's what you should do. I said, you're never going to retire, which is a good thing because a lot people, even now, I'm at 50 and I've learned I'm never retiring either. There's never going to be the opportunity to retire if you're doing something you love. So exactly. you're just, it's a, why retire if you do something you love? Because nope. there's that four weeks vacation, six weeks vacation or two. That's enough. You don't need to have a day. What do you do all day? Uh, nothing. That's not. Yeah. That's, I mean, I've been I've been a freelancer and an independent, you know, guy from day one. So it's all just using the time you have in the day. And there's a lot of hours in the day. You know, you work some for money. You work some because it's a, you write during the other ones because you want to write. And you have your family and you have, you know, it's time to be in the community and you just have to balance all those things. And it can be a juggling act, but everybody has to figure out the balance. And I think eventually writers that are the happiest figure it out in a way that that works for everybody. All right. Best place we can purchase the book and stuff, Stone, and where can we go? It is uh, widely available. It's uh, bookstores. If they don't stock it, can order it via Ingram. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. The publisher uh, site is arrow, A-R-R-O-W, editions.com, available there. And uh, it's in a Kindle form as well. And I, I appreciate the chance to talk to you both, Neil and Paul. And Stona, is Thank there you. a place you as a freelancer people can contact you and stuff? For work? Oh, yeah. Uh, my site is just stonafitch.com. Okay. And uh, I'm available there. And I'm on Instagram with stonafitch. All right. Excellent. We appreciate Stona. Yeah. Thank you. Take Thank care. you guys. Appreciate All right, you're listening you. and watching the Neil Haley Show, and we'll be back in just a moment.